Hey everybody and welcome back to H Invests. So today we're going to be looking at British American Tobacco, one of the big four cigarette conglomerates. And we're going to be doing a full stock analysis and seeing whether it's a buy or whether we should leave it alone and go for some other investments. Uh, this was once a well-loved stock by the institutions, you know, tobacco is a mature, stable industry. It's slow growing, but it's stable and it's very non-cyclical. So a lot of the institutions loved it. But since then, we've had this ESG movement, you know, ethical investing has really taken a hold. And we've seen massive share price declines as big institutions have been selling off. So the question is, has this created an undervaluation opportunity? Uh, British American Tobacco is currently trading around nine times free cash flow with a dividend yield of over 7%. So this could be a very attractive opportunity for income investors. Or is there something screaming at us that says we shouldn't buy this company? Let's go and find out. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Despite being called British American Tobacco, not much of their revenue comes from Britain. Uh, just under half of their revenue does come from the United States, but they're an incredibly global uh, tobacco supplier. They're kind of competing with uh, Philip Morris International for kind of top spot in terms of being a global tobacco uh, conglomerate. And in terms of their products, obviously they tell tobacco. Uh, their main brands of cigarettes include Dunhill, Kent, Pow Mau and Lucky Strike to name the most common ones. Although management, they really have this focus on the innovative side of it and they're trying to expand their portfolio into the non-combustible cigarette market as well. Uh, and they actually, they forecasted in the most recent annual report that they're trying to get 5 billion in revenue uh, in their non-combustible alternative products selection by 2025. So five, 5 billion from there if you think about they're generating about 25, 26 billion of revenue at the moment, that's quite a significant amount of revenue they're looking to generate from non-combustibles in the future. So in terms of their alternative pipeline, their main product is something called Vipe, which is basically an e-cigarette. Uh, and recently they've started to get really into e-commerce. So with tobacco, traditionally, you know, you go and buy it in a shop. With the e-cigarette market, British American Tobacco are really tapping into the e-commerce segment, uh, which is really, really good to see. You've also got Glow, which is a heat stick product, and then Velo, which is a type of chewable tobacco. Another thing to note about British American Tobacco is they have recently acquired uh, Reynolds American, which is a large tobacco company in the US on its own. And this is going to give it even more exposure to the US market. A lot of analysts have said uh, that this is a positive thing because with regards to tobacco, uh, it's pretty cheap in the US compared to a lot of other developed markets. So there's actually room for them to keep growing their prices in the US. And that's what you've got to note about the tobacco sector because what happens is revenue is declining as cigarette volume is declining but prices are going up, right? And that is how these tobacco companies are able to keep growing their revenue. So with British American Tobacco having more exposure to the US market, this will give them room to keep raising prices and thus keep growing their revenue. If you're enjoying this video so far, please give it a like and share it with your fellow investors. Think about this. We used to see adverts like this in the tobacco sector uh, where, similar to any other industry, uh, different companies would go and they would compete for the market share. But now, in the tobacco sector, we see massive bans on advertising all around the world. And this means, obviously, these companies, they can't advertise. And the product of that is that we get these companies having very stable market share of each of their cigarette brands. So this actually leads to a really wide economic moat because when businesses can't advertise, what customers usually do. They usually stick with their same cigarette brand that they've always used because there's nothing really pushing them to change and boom. And therefore British American Tobacco can keep making money from its current brands. The other thing you've got to consider is there are huge barriers to entry in the cigarette market because of all of the regulations surrounding it and selling cigarettes. You know, there's very few people that are really going into that market. There's a lot of people trying to get into the marijuana market because people know that's a massive growth industry, but the tobacco sector, 
It's incredibly mature, huge barriers to entry. It's not really worth it for any new entrants to come in, particularly with the massive bans on advertising. So therefore it's dominated by these few players, you know, British American Tobacco, and then Ultra, Philip Morris, uh, Imperial Brands, and then Japan Tobacco. So they usually retain the market share very, very well. However, if we do see this, this shift towards the e-cigarette market, they might be competing with a lot more new companies because there's gonna be many more growth opportunities there. Uh, the barriers to entry are still there in terms of regulation, um, but people might try and go after them and try and jump through those hoops. But yes, in conclusion, British American Tobacco do have a wide economic moat. On the flip side of this, you can never invest with a company without there being risks to consider. Uh, with regards to British American Tobacco, I think the biggest one is this ESG uh, risk, where we've seen the institutions really take a more ethical stance, looking at what the company's externality is on society, uh, particularly as we have the millennial generation starting to earn a bit more money and looking at which funds to invest in. They're often very ethically conscious and they don't want to see British American Tobacco as the largest holding in a fund manager's portfolio. So that's the biggest risk. And that's where we've seen the share price decline so much in the recent years. Uh, I will say, you know, British American Tobacco, they know this. And if you go onto the first page of their uh, investment case in their annual report, you'll see all kinds of ESG environmental related stuff. Uh, but this doesn't undo the fact that they are a cigarette company and they sell products which can really damage people's health. So that's the biggest risk, I think, with investing in British American tobacco. Something to think about with this, though, is the shares are yielding 7%, right? It's not like they were up in 2017, you know, they're yielding 3 4% and they had a long way to fall. They're now yielding in this 7 to 8% range. And you have to think, how much further can it go? When these dividends are fully covered, we'll look at the dividend in more detail later. But like, how much further can it go uh, when the dividend is fully covered by free cash flow? It's growing and it's steady. Uh, and it, you know, in my opinion, it has the potential to create a flaw in the share price where eventually, if it gets down to a certain yield, investors will just bid it back up. And this could be a situation that we see with British American Tobacco at the moment. Another thing to consider with British American Tobacco is the regulation and the excise taxes. So what excise taxes are, uh, is basically, it's like a VAT, like a tax on the good, but the buyer doesn't pay it. The, the cost is reflected in the seller. Uh, so this really hurts the profit margins of cigarette companies when these excise taxes are placed on them. Uh, in terms of regulation, you know, I don't think that we're ever going to see a black white cigarettes banned uh, kind of scenario in many countries and British American tobacco is mitigated against this risk quite well because of their geographical exposure but nonetheless regulation is a concern uh, and you've seen the regulation go about over the decades right going from free advertising all the way to uh, you know you have to put the cigarettes are damaging to health on the packets and no advertising at all this has certainly been effective in reducing the number of smokers and this brings me on to my third point because now that the number of smokers are going down and I think it peaked all the way back in the 1960s and they, these tobacco companies have been fighting this negative trend by relying on higher and higher prices every year and you have to think that's not the most organic growth in the world you know they're, they're fighting a big headwind and eventually they're going to lose as I said it's nice to see um, that Reynolds American have been a big acquisition of British American tobacco and they can get more exposure into the US where it's a bit cheaper to buy tobacco and they have more headroom to raise prices. But then again, at the end of the day, it's not like they are selling a growing product. It is in structural decline and whilst the decline of tobacco has been very slow, it is happening nonetheless. One final thing to consider is we're going through a global pandemic and COVID is a respiratory virus, right? Uh, and whilst actually COVID has been a tailwind for some of these tobacco companies because more people are on furlough at home, people are more flexible and it's allowed them to smoke more uh, and get back into that habit. At the end of the day, people might turn around and say, look, smoking is bad for health. Uh, if I smoke a lot, it might uh, increase my risk of having serious complications from COVID and people might become more health conscious and they might stop smoking. So 
that's another headwind that these tobacco companies are going to have to fight. Okay guys, let's have a quick look at these financial statements. So, the first thing I'll mention here actually is this is all in pounds. So, British American Tobacco, they're listed in the UK and in the US. Uh, we're currently going through the UK uh, reports, but as I said, they're also listed in the US and you'll find the dollar equivalent there. Um, but pounds is their predominant reporting currency. So, turnover, again, you know, you've got the upward trend. Uh, we haven't seen much growth recently. In fact, we've seen a bit of a decline in 2020. Um, and the forecasts are looking very slow, but very steady. Uh, so that is okay to see. As I said, we'd never expect the tobacco company to be setting the world on fire. Um, but then again, like if you look at the operating profit, that has been getting consistently higher and higher. Um, and this is what I'm talking about, high margins, right? Higher and higher margins because they're putting up their prices for tobacco all the time. Um, but their costs are pretty much staying the same, right? Their cost per pack is pretty much staying the same. Um, so you've got the cost of sales looking relatively consistent, and that is why you're seeing more of the turnover come through to operating profit. If we look at post-tax profit now, um, that is looking relatively consistent and stable in terms of an uptrend. I imagine 2017 was a bit of a fluke or something is going on funny with the accounting there, uh, but that's looking relatively good on the whole. Uh, looking at the balance sheet, this is an interesting one because you obviously the first thing you look at is you say, right, like the total assets are much more than total liabilities. But if you actually look at it as a short term picture, their, their current ratio is low. You've only got 13 billion in current assets, but then 15.5 billion in current liabilities. So they're not doing too well on that side of things. And a lot of their balance sheet is all down to intangibles, you know, things like brand value, goodwill. Uh, and that kind of stuff. And really, what's that? They only have 22 billion uh, in terms of tangible assets. So that's something you've got to consider. The balance sheet doesn't look amazing. Um, what is their debt? Their long-term borrowing is pretty stable over the last four years, um, which is looking okay. In fact, if you go over here, and if we look at some of the balance sheet ratios, we can have a look at it in a little bit more detail. So as I said, current ratio is low, below one. Um, and the debt to free cash flow is okay. I mean, it's not a terrible balance sheet, but it, you'd ideally want to see it a little bit healthier. You can give it a bit of a pass, uh, being such a stable industry and knowing that their turnover is roughly going to be the same as what it was last year, but you'd like to see better. The cash flow statement is looking pretty good on the whole, uh, net cash on operations going up. Um, the capex is very, very low. Like look at the capex as a percentage of operating cash flow. Uh, it's very low. And as you can see, again, it's going down. The CapEx has remained relatively stable over time and was very low in 2020. Uh, but the operating cash flow is on the uptrend. So you can see their free cash flow there. But if you actually look at what they're doing with their cash, dividends paid in cash, look at that. It's, uh, I mean, their free cash flow dividend cover is huge. You're doing 7 billion in free cash flow, only paying 4.7 uh, billion out in dividends. And they've got a 7% plus dividend yield. I just think that is really, really crazy. Like the amount of free cash flow that you're getting from this company is absolutely huge. As I mentioned to you earlier, it's got a price of free cash flow of nine. So very impressive on that front. Like on the whole, in terms of the financial statements, like they're okay. The income statement and the cash flow statement are better than the balance sheet. But as I said, because British American Tobacco is mature and it's not particularly volatile, they can afford to take on a little bit more debt. However, I would like to see that current ratio and that quick ratio above one. Quick look at the chart. So you can see the long-term uh, price trajectory of British American Tobacco was pretty good. As I said, very, very stable sector. Uh, in fact, you can see in the, uh, the big financial crash, there was, um, they handled that very well compared to the average company. As I said, they're very safe stock. Uh, yeah, what did they do? So went from 18, quickly bottomed out at 15, but went back up to 17, lows of 15, but then very quickly recovered again. Uh, so it was clear that the, uh, you know, in recession, this, these companies tend to do a lot better. They have a much lower beta or volatility than the overall market. And then we saw the massive price reversal in 2017. And this was the same kind of pattern you saw from all the tobacco companies. But you remember since then, you know, turnover, free cash flow have been going up. But the share price is what? It's half of what it was at its peak. Um, so that's just something to consider.
If you look at it recently, it's below where it was trading pre-COVID, so that's an interesting observation. Uh, and not just below, but almost 20% below. Uh, and if we zoom in on this sector, you can see a really, really strong resistance level at about 23, 24. There was a bit of resistance at the upper end of 24 recently. So, so this resistance line is something to definitely consider, uh, particularly going forward to see if these shares continue to bounce off this level. Okay, let's take a look at some of these valuations. So here we have the free cash flow. You've got the free cash flow growth. You guys saw this in the cash flow statement. And then you've got the free cash flow growth going forward. Uh, this is the average analyst uh, estimates of the free cash flow growth. Uh, and then you can see what the expected share price would be at different free cash flow growth rates and different discount rates. Uh, obviously, with the long run growth being reflected in what the free cash flow growth is here. Uh, but that's capped. The, up, the upper bound of it is capped at 2.5%. Um, and then you can see the share prices and you've got the upside of a downside. So the conclusion from here is that if you think it's going to grow at, a, at about minus, well, if, it's, if you think it's going to shrink um, by less than about four, three or four percent, then the shares are definitely undervalued. Uh, I think the discount rate for this, I mean, when you do WAC, it comes out at 62 uh, I think probably seven is more appropriate given some of the risks that I mentioned. But, you know, nonetheless, tobacco is a very stable sector. Uh, the beta is low. Uh, they're still able to borrow relatively cheaply. But, uh, you know, that balance sheet didn't look amazing. So I'll be most inclined to go for a 7% discount rate, maybe eight if you want to be really, really conservative. Uh, but even with eight, you know, if you think the shares are going to shrink at two, sorry, if you think the free cash flow growth is going to shrink at two, 2%, uh, then the shares are fairly valued. But if you think it's going to remain flat, uh, then the shares are undervalued by a long, long, long way. Um, and if you kind of average out uh, what the analysts are looking at, you compound that growth, um, and then you get a really, really, really high share price. Do I think the shares are worth this much? Probably not. And it's obviously hard to say with a discounted cash flow because you get a really wide range of estimates. But the conclusion from this is that unless you think that free cash flow is really going to shrink, uh, and the trajectory is still been very much upward. They're still a growing company uh, and the free cash flow projections are upwards. So it's not looking like it's going to shrink. And if you don't think it's going to shrink, uh, then the shares are definitely undervalued. Another thing to consider is British American Tobacco's dividend payments, right? So if we look at this and if we add up the uh, dividend payments that British American Tobacco paid last year, again, we're working with pounds. Um, and then look at the at different yields, what implied share price would that give you? So that's what we're trying to figure out. So you can see at 7%, um, this implies a share price of 30, meaning the shares are 10.5% undervalued. This is kind of how it's working. Um, and you just kind of have to think about what kind of yield do you think the market would be comfortable with, right? So obviously I've got the average down here, 1.4% of the S&P 500. Um, I don't think British American Tobacco is going to get anywhere near that level because people uh, buy it as an income stock primarily, right? Tobacco not setting the world on fire, uh, they're going to be much more of an income stock. So people are buying it for yield. Uh, but obviously, you know, in the region of 7-8% yield where it's trading at the moment, um, that is incredibly attractive for income, best, income investors. And what might happen is say if the income investors uh, bid up the share price of British American Tobacco for the yield and drive the yield down to 5% because obviously price and yield have an inverse relationship, then that implies a share price of £42, uh, which gives you 55% upside. So it's just something else to consider when thinking about British American Tobacco shares. I don't think they're going to get to 4% ever. I don't think they're going to get to 3%. Could they get in the region of 5 to 6 I think so. Uh, a 7.5% yield at the moment is incredibly generous. And you just have to think, if the, if the investors do put up the shares to 5% yield, then that it does imply a share price of £42 with that 55% upside. I also like to have a look at what the uh, sell side are actually forecasting in terms of price targets. So I have some companies that publish equity research here and I've got their price targets. I actually couldn't find that many. Uh, but for the ones I found, you can see they're very, very bullish. 
Uh, just to note, this is in dollars. I just found it easier to find uh, the price targets for um, British American tobacco on the American exchange. But it'll be the very similar story for uh, the British exchange uh, because these um, research firms will just adjust their price targets accordingly. So we've got Morningstar, Thomson Reuters, uh, you've got Seeking Alpha, which is basically just the average of all the uh, analyst price targets that they can find. And then you've also got Credit Suisse. Uh, and if you average those out, it's 35% upside with a target price of $52. Uh, and a lot of these price targets have been raised recently, which is very, very interesting. Um, so that's something to note. The analysts are looking bullish on British American tobacco. In conclusion, do I think British American tobacco are a buy right now? Well, on the quantitative side, things look very good. Particularly when you look at some of the discounted cash flow forecasts, even at pretty pessimistic growth rates. If you look at the dividend yield, the 7 plus percent, that's attractive for income investors. And also the sell side seem to have really changed their tune. Uh, and they're now pretty bullish on British American tobacco. Uh, looking at kind of the company as a whole, uh, the tobacco sector is attractive because it's very non-cyclical, it's very stable, it's slow, it's steady, it's easy to predict. Um, however, on the flip side, you know, we have got that risk of the market bidding it down a lot because it's ESG and they don't want to touch tobacco and that's fair enough. Uh, and also we want to keep an eye out for the headwinds such as the excise taxes and any further regulation that we may see. On the whole, I'd definitely say the shares look attractive right now. Uh, this is not a recommendation, but I've added British American Tobacco to my portfolio at the current market price of £27. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed my research. If you have any stocks you'd like me to cover, please drop them in the comments. I wish you all the best with your investing, and I'll see you in the next video.